Um, so if you look at how, um, how a turbo works on an engine, it's a feedback loop. The, the engine is making some exhaust, the exhaust is driving a tur the turbine wheel, the turbine is driving a compressor, it's pumping more air into the engine. That makes more exhaust energy, that drives the turbo higher, faster, and you get this cycle. That's where turbo lag comes from, though, is you've got to start this cycle going. Uh, so the, the, the biggest challenge we had is to get this car to feel completely naturally aspirated to, to someone who's, you know, not a car enthusiast and not super involved in how the engine's going to respond. They just want to step on the gas and it goes directly and intuitively. So we want to get that cycle going immediately right off idle. Uh, and there's not very much exhaust energy available off idle. So why don't you bring me the cylinder head. Um, we developed a whole new cylinder head for this. Um, and we've got two different exhaust pads. Um, we haven't practiced this, as you can tell. Um, so this is the, the exhaust manifold, and there's, there's two different exhaust ports, a, a, a high RPM one down here and one that we'll use at low RPM. And uh, so we're looking at here at a cross section of this. We're looking at just one, uh, one exhaust port as it feeds into the turbo. Uh, and at low RPM, we force all the exhaust through this tiny little port. Um, because there's so little exhaust energy available right off idle, if we force it through this port, it's very much like putting our thumb uh, over a hose. Um, and we can accelerate that exhaust, inter exhaust flow up to a higher speed and it'll hit the turbine uh, and drive it uh, up to speed more quickly. Um, this is fundamentally pretty similar to um, uh, a variable nozzle turbo, uh, the, but we are doing it in the exhaust port instead of in the turbo and this has some uh, effects uh, that benefit the engine itself. Um, the, the challenge in developing a, a, a turbo engine is that what a turbo wants to perform well and what an engine wants to perform well are kind of at odds with each other. So we're trying to throw a lot of energy into that turbo to spool it up, but doing that restricts exhaust flow. It makes it harder to, to get the engine to breathe. Um, let's grab the exhaust manifold. We'll... At the end of each cycle, we want to get all of the exhaust out of the cylinder so that there isn't the residual heat from that exhaust when we come into the next cycle. If we can get the heat of the combustion down, we can reduce its tendency to knock, uh, and that'll allow us to run higher compression, which is more efficient. So in our naturally aspirated engines, this is a CX-5 manifold. We have this long manifold that separates the exhaust pulses uh, so that the, the exhaust pulse that's, that's just beginning doesn't have a chance to interfere with the exhaust pulse from the previous cylinder that's just ending. Those two events overlap each other. So the amount of time it takes for an exhaust pulse to travel all the way down this runner and all the way back and up another runner and interfere with another cylinder is long enough that there's enough time for those valves to, to take turns and, and close. Now, a turbo at the end of this exhaust manifold won't have enough energy to spool up quickly, so we can't use this big, big thing. And that's why uh, we'll go back and to the, to the head now. <laughs> I need Vanna up here to help me as well. So uh, we can't use that big long bundle of snakes with the turbo. We have to, we have to make everything work within that, uh, within that short uh, one inch manifold. So what we did is this very unusual um, strategy where we have uh, only three exhaust ports. This is not an exhaust port even though it looks like one. Um, We've siamese the middle two exhaust ports, and the reason we're doing this is we want to uh, use uh, what we call the ejector effect, which is this uh, sort of a, the same principle that's in, a, in an airbrush. So you know in an airbrush you have uh, air shooting out of the brush, and it shoots across a little straw, uh, and the suction created uh, by that jet of air draws the paint up uh, into, the, into, the pa into, the, uh, into the air. Um, so there's a suction effect when you have a, a high velocity flow there. Um, what we did is we paired the exhaust uh, like this where we have the center two exhausts merged together so that we can use the high energy exhaust flow to, to drive, to pull in the other one. Let me back up here and explain why that works. Um, so at the beginning of the exhaust stroke, we, we have a huge amount of energy. We've just, uh, we just burned all this air and fuel. Uh, we open the valve, all of that comes rushing out. And then most of the energy is out of the cylinder, but we have the rest of the exhaust stroke to kind of gently push the rest of the exhaust out. So we have uh, a, an energy curve that looks like this. We have this huge burst and then we're just sort of wafting out the rest of the cycle. Um, and because of the way the, the, uh, uh, the valve events overlap, we have one cylinder at the beginning of that cycle just as the previous cylinder is right at the end of this cycle. And we're trying to avoid that pulse interfering with, with this little bit at the end. Um, by pairing the, the cylinders together, if we look at the firing order of a four-cylinder engine being one, three, four, two. 
uh, we merge these middle two cylinders together so we always have the high energy flow at the beginning of one exhaust stroke right next to the low energy flow of uh, the previous exhaust stroke. So imagine this is the air and this is the paint. And on the next cylinder, this one's the air and this is the paint and they're right next to each other still. This is the air, this is the paint, they're still right next to each other. And again, they're right next to each other. So pairing uh, into those three exhaust ports lets us use this sort of airbrush effect to extract uh, the exhaust from the, from the previous cycle, uh, uh, from the end of the exhaust stroke on the other, uh, other cylinder much more efficiently. This lowers the combustion temperature, lets us run higher compression, make the engine more efficient. That's good, you can put that down. <laughs> that made a lot of sense, didn't it? <laughs> Um, another trick that we're doing with this engine um, is, is to make the engine hit the fuel economy that you see on the EPA label when you're driving in the real world um, is, is avoiding this, this uh, fuel enrichment problem uh, that pretty much all engines deal with. Uh, so on an EPA drive cycle, you drive very gently uh, and um, the engine is able to run at sort of an optimal air fuel ratio. When you drive more aggressively, you're harder on the throttle, the combustion temperatures get higher and you get closer to a, a temperature limit where we're going to either melt down a catalyst or a turbo or something in the engine is going to have a temperature limit that limits how, how high our combustion temperature can be. And so to control that combustion temperature, pretty much everybody will use the, the easiest method available, which is simply to throw more fuel in the combustion chamber under those conditions. Counterintuitively, more fuel makes the combustion cooler. Um, so if we look at uh, what happened here, this is the, this is the torque curve of, the, uh, of our old CX-7, which is a 2.3 liter turbo. This is how much torque it could generate uh, at maximum output. But it could only generate this much uh, before it had to go into this additional enrichment. So it could run optimal air fuel up to here and then any more than that and we're throwing extra fuel at, this, at the problem. Uh, this is fundamentally why most downsized turbo engines don't do in the real world what they do on the label. Um, it's not exclusively uh, a turbo engine thing. This is what was going on uh, in the old CX-9. At low RPM, we could, we could go pretty uh, uh, high into the torque curve uh, before we had to go into fuel enrichment. But at high RPM, as these, as these combustion events are happening faster and faster, we have to start going into enrichment. This makes it actually look worse than it is. This is a binary chart that says no enrichment, some enrichment. The amount of enrichment you have to throw into a turbo is a lot more. So the, the uh, efficiency up in this dark area is lower in a turbo engine than it is in a naturally aspirated engine. But you get the idea. Um, with this new engine, what we wanted to do is be able to operate at an optimal air fuel ratio almost all of the, through almost all of the performance envelope. This really uh, huge uh, area lets you drive the car as you want without really having to sacrifice fuel economy. You're not going into this enrichment zone in normal driving almost ever. <clears throat> so how do we do it? How do we manage to, to stay at an optimal air fuel ratio under such high load? Um, instead of throwing extra fuel into the cylinder to keep it cooler, we're using a cooled EGR system. EGR is exhaust gas recirculation. We're taking some of the exhaust uh, out of the exhaust manifold, running it back and throwing it back into the intake, which after all of that stuff I was explaining about how we're trying to get the exhaust out, seems kind of a strange thing to do, right? Um, the reason we want to, to put the exhaust back in, in the intake is we've already take, burned the oxygen out of it. And with less oxygen, it's going to burn more slowly, and burn a little bit cooler, and, and that gives us a little bit more, uh, a little bit more headroom and a little bit more knock resistance. Um, but in order for it to keep from that, that heat from uh, causing a problem, we have to run it through a cooler. So that's what that fourth port was uh, on the cylinder head, was the EGR port, where we pull a little bit of exhaust, run it back through the cylinder head where it cools down a little bit going through past some coolant passages, and then it goes into an air to water heat exchanger that sits on top of the intake manifold. It's a little cooler, uh, brings it back down to close to ambient temperatures, throw it back into the intake. And then the fact that we have less oxygen, of course, makes less power, but we've raised the knock limit so much that we're actually able to run more boost, uh, throw more pressure in there, and still not run into our knock limit and actually end up making more power without having to go into fuel enrichment. Now, this is a pretty well understood uh, 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 phenomenon and, and, and strategy. Um, it's almost never used because it doesn't have any impact on the EPA test. Uh, again, the EPA test is drive, it's driven so gently that you don't need to go into enrichment, so you don't need to use this trick to do that. The only reason you're going to spend the money to put this on an engine is if you actually care what happens in the real world. Uh, so 
this sort of this is the flip side of, of, of ignoring the catalog and paying attention to the real world is we're going to have to go ahead and, and spend the money and do something like this so that, uh, so that it actually satisfies uh, customers after they've bought the car, not just before. Um, another interesting uh, tidbit on this engine is uh, we, we learned the hard way with the CX-7 that people do not like to put premium fuel in their car. Uh, so we had to tune this engine for, for 87 octane. Um, there was a little bit more power available at high RPM if we put premium fuel in there. And rather than doing the traditional and very confusing strategy of saying premium recommended instead of required, which means you can, well, nobody really understands what that means. Uh, and so because they don't understand what that means, we're just going to say you can use either fuel and here's what you'll get with either, with, with either one. So uh, above 4,000 RPM, we make a little bit more power uh, on 93 uh, octane. So here's the way it's actually going to be rated. 310 foot-pounds of torque, uh, no matter what fuel you put in there. Uh, but uh, you get 227 horsepower at high RPM uh, if you're on 87, 250 if you're on 93, something in the middle if you're in California and all you can get is 91. Uh, the fact is, we think because of what we've observed in, in how the engine operates when you're driving in the, in the real world, people will probably put premium in this once or twice, not feel any difference, and go back to using regular. Uh, but at least by rating it both ways, they'll be well informed and can make that decision themselves. The other big advantage of going to this uh, Turbo 4 is, is weight. Uh, we saved 132 pounds over the, over the V6, uh, combined with a much uh, stronger, more structurally efficient Skyactiv platform. This, is, this car is built on the, the same uh, uh, platform architecture that goes from the Mazda 3, Mazda 6, and CX-5. Uh, it was designed from the outset to go up to, to this size. Um, that's a much more efficient architecture, so we saved a lot of weight there. And then there's a couple of extravagances, like that giant hood is aluminum, so we save a lot of weight there. Altogether, we come up about 260 pounds uh, lighter than, than the old car. Um, again, somewhat counterintuitively, this helped us make the NVH much better, uh, because it gave us, the, the, the car was so much lighter, it gave us a headroom uh, to, to put more insulation in. Uh, 